Hi everyone, um, welcome to the first video on my channel and let's get started with Storm's Principle which is a really powerful mathematical tool that most people don't know about. Storm's Principle is a method for solving bounded inequalities that is inequalities having a condition that needs to be satisfied. It's not very well known and I really don't know why. I mean you can google it up anywhere you want and the only results will be about Storm's theorem which is a completely different thing. The only place I've seen Storm's Principle mentioned is in this wonderful book, Putnam and Beyond. And that's the only place I've ever read about it. But I honestly think that more people should know about it because it is extremely useful for solving such inequalities. Now let's get a bit of a general view about what exactly it is. Um, it's a method that helps to uh, get straight to proving the inequality. And that's one of its strongest points. Uh, once you see the question, you can directly start solving it. There's no sitting around searching for some construction to be made or finding the right variable to play around with to apply AMGM or Cauchy Schwartz on. So there's no time wasted staring and thinking about the problem, trying to figure out what exactly to do with the expression and how to manipulate it. And it's a very, very powerful theorem. I've solved many questions using it that were originally intended to be solving using AMGM or Cauchy Schwartz or other important inequalities but can also be solved using this. The cons of this method are is that it's only useful in certain scenarios which we'll cover ahead uh, and the solutions are often lengthy. They're definitely lengthier than the solutions involving other standard inequalities. However, I'd like to elaborate on this. This method is mostly going to be used by students who are preparing for Olympiads or other mathematical competitions such as the Putnam. And in competitions like these, you get a lot of time for a single question, ranging from an, a half hour to more than an hour. So spending 20 to 30 minutes writing out one solution is definitely not bad if it actually helps you solve the problem. The idea behind the principle. So the principle states is that if a function f achieves a minima on a given interval, and none of the points besides a given point p are minima, then p must be the minima. Uh, the same argument, along with everything I explained in the next few slides, will apply to the maxima as well. Now, elaborating on the statement, it seems like a pretty obvious thing, doesn't it? There's nothing advanced about it. Why, why is there anything special about it? Well, the thing is, applying it in practice, which we'll see later, is a very powerful method that can solve many, many questions that isn't usually approached that way. But first, let's talk about the statement and the prerequisite, if a function f achieves a minima. How do we know if the function achieves a minima or not? In some cases, it's pretty visible. Like over here, anyone could say that the minima is at b. But how exactly are we defining a minima here without calculus, of course? Well, we can say that the points around b have a higher value of the function than the point at b. And that's why b is a minima. Some functions such as 1 upon root x don't have a minima. Over here, no matter how far you go, the function keeps decreasing. It tends to 0, but it never actually reaches 0. And no matter how far out you go, the point on your left is going to have a higher value and the point on the right is going to have a lower value. And as such, the minima doesn't really exist. What about in a certain interval? Over here, a, the line of the graph doesn't really have a bowl shaped bottom. But we can say that it does have a minima at a, since that is the lowest point in the graph when it comes to the given interval. Now an important point to note is that the minimum value is taken exactly at point a, and the function must be defined on closed interval a, b. If it was defined on an open interval a, b, then we wouldn't really have a point that was the minima. If we talk about a point very close to a, say a plus h, where h is a very small positive value, we could reduce the value by going to a plus h by 2. And as such, we're reducing the value by moving within the given interval. And as such, we'd never have a minima because we could keep repeating the process and never really reach a value at which we could stop. So the summary of our discussion regarding whether the minima exists is that a continuous function on a bounded and closed subset of r raised to n always attains its minima and maxima where r raised to n signifies a vector of n real numbers, so the function might have multiple inputs. Bounded because we saw that extreme at infinity, such as 1 upon root x, are not really attainable. You can keep going forward, but you'd never reach a minima. Closed because we saw that the extreme at the endpoints are not attainable in open sets, and that's why it needs to be closed if we are to say for sure that it must have a minima. Now, how exactly do we solve questions using this? We first check 
using the conditions on the previous page or other viable methods that you would find that the given function attains a minima or a maxima. So we need to prove that it attains a minima or maxima. After that, we hypothesize that a given point is the required minima or maxima, which we often find using observation or symmetry. And then, for example, for the minima, we prove that no other point besides this specific point is a minima. How exactly do we do that? Here's a question. Now, this is a question from the same book that I told you about, Putnam and Beyond. It's a very nice question and it's a perfect example of application of this theorem. Now, if you want to give it a try yourself, which I suggest you should, please pause the video and spend a few minutes trying to think about it and think about your approach using this principle. And I'm going to be continuing right now, but feel free to pause the video and spend some time before you see the solution. Now, the solution here uh, is first starts off with the observation. Now, before we start off with that, we need to see that the conditions given on the previous slide were a closed and bounded subset of real n because they were closed as x, all the x were positive real numbers and none of them was greater than one. And they could all attain one. So that means it was closed and it was bounded as well. By symmetry, we observe that at all x equal to one upon n, equality holds. Now, how do we prove that this is the minima? So from starting from any other point, we show that the value can be reduced. For any other point, there must be some xi greater than one upon n and xj smaller than one upon n. If it wasn't so, then all of the x's would be equal to one upon n and we are at the point of equality that we considered above that we claim is the minima. For any other point, taking those xi and xj, we take a small positive value p such that p is greater than zero but less than xi minus xj, which is a positive value. On replacing xi with xi minus p and xj with xj plus p, only the factors containing these two variables will change. Now before we proceed further, I'd like to speak about this choice of p. If we took p greater than xi minus xj, then xi would become lower than xj and xj would become greater than xi on doing this transformation. We need to ensure that the variables come closer to 1 upon n than they were before because that is what we hypothesize, that 1 upon n is the minima. Anyways, continuing, on substituting the new values of the variables in the product, we can see that the expression transforms into this thing right here. And this thing at the bottom, xi minus xj minus p multiplied by p is a positive term from the selection of p inequality. And for on re removing a positive term from the denominator, we are increasing the value of the fraction, which happens to be the original product. Now, how exactly did we know what term to remove? Although it looks all magical and improved, how it actually works is that we solve forward from this expression and we also solve backward from this expression. And then we reach this and this expression and we compare them and we see that there is an extra positive factor in the denominator here, which implies that this must be smaller. Then we arrange the steps and put them in the proof like this. <laughs> what we have proved is that by uh, selecting such a P and taking up uh, the new values, we have reduced the value of the function and as such the original point that we started with was not a minima. Thus the minimum must be the only point that is not covered by this method. That is the point where all the x's are equal to 1 upon n, where we have already proved equality to the RHS and as such the proof is complete. Now here's one question for you people to try and try to figure out the answer uh, and try to get the proof and it's a really neat practice uh, first terms principle. This is a question from the Indian team selection test during the IMO 2004 training camp. So this is a really high level question and it's uh, for those of you who know about Olympiads, you know what the weight of the Indian team selection test is. So feel free to take some time out and give this question a try. Before I end this video, I just want to give a shout out to 3D1D for organizing some of mathematical exposition one. And as he said in his video, dangling that tiniest carrot that pushed me to make this video. So thank you for organizing this. And thank you all for watching the video. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content. And it's my first video, so please comment down in the uh, comment section below. Anything you want me to know, any suggestions or feedback or what you want me to cover next, please feel free to. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'll see you later.